passion to remind us of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And I want to talk to you today about the work of the Holy Spirit and what I consider to be the greatest work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And a message entitled, Love Without Limits. A pastor pastored a small church up in the mountains, and he would walk to church on Sunday mornings where he would go over his notes and get his heart ready. But that particular Sunday morning, a dog came out of nowhere and started to chase him, and he dropped his sermon notes and ran for his life. The dog tore up his sermon notes. When he got up to preach to his congregation, he said, I have to apologize today. I don't have a sermon that I prepared on my way to church. A dog ate my sermon. I guess I'll just have to depend upon the Holy Spirit. We all need to learn to depend upon the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? Why was he sent? What is his work in our lives? The Holy Spirit is mentioned 261 times in the New Testament alone. The Holy Spirit began his work at creation. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, the book of Genesis tells us. The Holy Spirit was at work in the ministry of the humanity of Jesus and came with power to the early church on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit is not a force. He's not emotionalism. He's not psychic energy. He's the third member of the triune Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's coexistent, co-eternal, co-equal with God the Father and God the Son. When Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit, he said, you must be born again by the Spirit, not by religion, but by what God does in you. In John 3, verse 5, unless a person is born of the water, natural birth, and of the Spirit, they cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Jesus said, the Spirit empowers us. In Acts 1, verse 8, you shall receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses. Paul says when we're saved, the Holy Spirit lives within us. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, do not realize your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. The Apostle Paul tells us that we all need to be filled with the Spirit. In Ephesians 5 and 18, we read, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Jude tells us that we need to pray in the Spirit. In verse 20 of his brief letter, but dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. We need to listen to the Holy Spirit for the book of Revelation it says, Revelation 2 and 7 Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. The Spirit works in us, through us, and for us. But I want to talk about what is the greatest work of the Holy Spirit in a person's life. And that is the importation of divine love into the human heart so that we can love others as God loves us. We can talk about the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit and the manifestations of the Spirit, but the greatest work is found in Romans 5, verse 5, and hope does not disappoint us, does not put us to shame, that it means our hope in Christ, because God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom He has given to us. What a remarkable, miraculous statement. God has poured out his love, his divine love, his perfect love, his covenant love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom he has given to us. God's love is an unconditional love. It's a divine love. It's a covenant love. It's a faithful love. It's a loyal love. It's a love that transcends in any human understanding. It was a love that we were created with, but sin destroyed Sin turned us inward upon ourselves with a self-centeredness. When Jesus redeems us, we're born again, and the Spirit of God restores in us the image of God, and the image of God is love. So dramatic, so miraculous that God pours out his love into our hearts. And there are three expressions of this poured out love. God 
first of all, pours out his love for us. He speaks of something that happened past tense. God has something happened in the past with abiding results in the present. He pours out his love into us, into our hearts, and he pours out his love through us. We love with such a conditional love, sometimes a manipulative love. We love one day and don't love the next. It was a young couple madly in love and until the day she broke off their engagement and he was shattered. He was depressed. She said, I never want to see you again. All of his hopes shattered. Their engagement ended. A few months later, he won the lottery and she heard about it. She said in this text, Dear Jimmy, I'm so sorry for breaking off our engagement. I'm so miserable without you. Will you please take me back? You're the love of my life. Please forgive me. I love you. I love you. I love you, Maria. P.S. Congratulations on winning the lottery. God has poured out his love into our hearts. This is the greatest work of the Holy Spirit, because if this doesn't happen, it negates everything else. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all laws, and though I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Though I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. God has poured out his love for us. God's poured out. This word means to send a torrential downpour. You know, when it rains all night and it thunders all night and you wake up in the morning and it's still dark and you feel like you're in the flood, that's what this means. I'm going to pour out my love on you. And Malachi expressed it this way in Malachi 3 and 10 when God said, I'll pour out on you a blessing. There's not room enough to contain. All of us here today are living under the outpour of the love of God in two ways, in creation and in the cross. You see, God's love is poured out on all of creation, all of the time, Jesus said in Matthew 5 and 45, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. You see, we live in the torrential downpour of the love and the blessings of God every moment of life, good and evil, righteous and unrighteous. Dr. Harry Ironside, pastor of the great Moody Church in Chicago, named after the evangelist Dwight Moody. One day he went to a deli for lunch. It was so crowded. So he went through the line and got his sandwich and sat down at a small table. And by the time a man walked up with his meal and said, do you mind if I sit with you? There's the only chair open. And Dr. Ironside invited him to have lunch with him. And the pastor, as he always did, bowed his head and prayed quietly and Gave God thanks, and at the end, he looked up, and the man said, are you okay? He said, do you have a headache? And he said, no. He said, I was just giving God thanks from a meal. He said, oh, you're one of those religious people. He said, I'm not. He said, I work hard for my money. I produce everything I have. I don't have to thank anybody. When I sit down to eat, I just dig right in. Dr. Ironside said, you're just like my dog. He does the same thing. Failing to recognize that we are living under the outpour of the love of God. God has poured out his love on us and for us. But most importantly, at the cross, and Paul has this in mind, in this past tense, God has poured out. He's done something historically, not a fictitious story not a fable of ancient times, but a real cross at a real place with a real Savior. Redemption was purchased and atonement was provided at Calvary. And so he goes on in verse 8 to say, for God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
while we were still sinners, while we were still rebellious, while we were still in doubt, while we were still going our own way, Christ died for us. That's how great God's love is. He's not waiting for an apology. He's not waiting for repentance. He's not waiting for change. He's not waiting for religious orthodoxy. While we were still sinners, at our worst possible state, the love of God was demonstrated. Christ died. He gave his life. He poured out his life to provide an atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world. Just recently, I went to preach on a Sunday evening for a friend of mine. They built a new building, had a dedication service, and I preached a message on why the church matters after the service. There were a number of other pastors that came and supported that special service, and I met one of the pastors afterwards, and he pastored in that state, and so I said, uh, well, where are you pastoring now? And he said, well, my wife and I just about three months ago took a church here, a long-term established church. We, we've taken the church over, said congratulations, and then he added, he said, the pastor before me had a moral failure, and I said, haven't we all? What's the news about that? Haven't we all? I talked to my friend the other day. He said, you know, that pastor called me. He said, he's still thinking about what you said. Isn't that the gospel? Why do we judge each other? Why do we condemn each other? Why do we feel that we're better than anybody? Have we all forgotten? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And had there not been that cross where Christ died for our sins, we would all be lost and separate from God. But at Calvary, love was poured out at this world. At Calvary, Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. At Calvary, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. At Calvary, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. At Calvary, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me at Calvary. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things pass away. All things become new. At Calvary, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. At Calvary, we declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. God has poured out his love on us. And for us, to God be the glory. And second of all, we learn that God has poured out his love, this amazing eternal love, into our little hearts. The center of the person, the soul, the real person, the eternal person. God has poured out his infinite love, his divine love, into our hearts. By the entrance of the Holy Spirit in us. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a baptism of love. And to be filled with the Holy Spirit manifests itself in an ever-growing, flourishing life of love. It is the one great mark of spiritual maturity, love. Not knowledge. Not knowledge. 2 Corinthians 8 and 1 says, knowledge puffs up, love builds up. It's the one great mark of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And as we are filled with the Spirit and we go back to Pentecost and say, Lord, we can't live on our own power. Fill me with the Spirit of God. There is an increased measure of love and devotion and passion and compassion and empathy and understanding and commitment. Those are manifestations of love, the love of God in the human heart. And it manifests itself in love for Jesus. That's what the book of Ephesians chapter 6 verse 24 says, grace to all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. I've heard about people who say, well, I was once a Christian, but 
I'm not anymore. You might have been in the religion, but you didn't know Jesus. There's no way you can love Jesus and ever leave him. You may have heard about him. Your parents may have taught you about him. They might have brought you to church. You may have left religion. But if you ever encounter Jesus and give him your heart, you will never leave him. You love him with an undying love. And isn't that the fruit of real faith in Jesus is love for Jesus? Whom having not seen you love, and though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with joy unspeakable and full of glory. First Peter chapter 1 verse 8 says, And when Peter denied the Lord, and it broke his heart, and he didn't realize he was capable of such weakness. Have you ever done something you, were, you didn't realize you were capable of doing it? And your own weakness shocked you? Well, that was where Peter was. Because he said, I'll never deny you, but he did. We're all weak in ways that we don't realize. Never boast of your strength. There's a weakness within us all. That's why we need the grace of God. And after the resurrection, Jesus met him and the others at the Sea of Galilee and had breakfast with him and then had a private moment with Jesus. And the Gospel of John closes with this remarkable conversation in John 21, verses 15 through 17. Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Peter said, Unless, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Then he asked him again, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He said, yes, Lord, I love you. You know that I love you. Well, take care of my lambs. And later on in the conversation, he came back to it. Simon, son of John, he asked him a third time, do you truly love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time. He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. You see, Peter had a lapse of faith, but he never had a lapse of love. And a true Christian is not marked only by what they believe. They're marked most predominantly by who they love. Grace to all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. And when we are filled with the Spirit, there is a love and a devotion to Jesus that eclipses all other loves. And then we love one another. And that's difficult. And that's why we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and I find that any time I preach on loving each other, it gets quiet. I've never understood that. If I preach on the return of Christ, it gets happy. If I preach on loving each other, it gets quiet. And Jesus said right before he went to the cross at the Last Supper in John 13, 34, and 35, a new commandment I give to you. And a lot of you have been given commandments all of your life. Some of you have been in religion. You've got all kind of commandments given to you. Forget all of that. Listen to Jesus. One command. A new command I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. By this will all people know you're my disciples. If you love one another... Love in the church. You see, the Bible says in Ephesians 5 and 26, Jesus loved the church and gave himself up for her. Do you love the church? Do you love the body of Christ? Do you love the family of God? If Jesus loves the church, should we do less? Are we going to serve a Lord who loves the church and we criticize the church and we complain about the church and we neglect the church? Love one another. The church is not an institution. It's not a building. It's not a denomination. It's people redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. He says, love one another. The world fights. It divides. 
It's in conflict, but in the kingdom of God, love one another. And you're a witness to the world that there's a greater and higher way to live. Love one another as I have loved you. And love starts at home. It starts in our marriage. It starts with our kids. It starts with our friends. Love one another. And it is the baptism of the Holy Spirit that so fills us with such a love that it overrides those fleshly emotions and tendencies we all have to get mad and to stay mad and to get hurt and to be divisive and to gossip. We all have those natural tendencies in our sin nature. But when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we overcome the works of the flesh and we produce the fruit of the Spirit is love. That's why we need to be filled with the Spirit so the love of God might flow freely in us toward each other. I heard about two sisters that had a fallen out, Mary and Alice, and they hadn't spoken in 30 years. Root of bitterness, and Mary got very sick, was hospitalized at the point of death, and Alice got word and decided she was going to go see her sister Mary, override her feelings, and it was an awkward moment when she walked into the hospital room and all that tension had been there for 30 years and she saw Mary in the bed very ill and walked over and Mary said to Allison, she said, the doctors say I'm very ill, but I want you to know if I don't make it, you're forgiven. But if I pull through, things stay the way they are. And heard someone say to me the other day, Pastor, I'm so tired of being angry. Are you? Are you tired of being angry? Are you tired of carrying the unforgiveness? Are you tired of being bitter? Are you tired of being resentful? Go to the upper room today and say, Holy Spirit, fill me with love. It'll wash all of those toxins out of your soul. And a love for the world. Jesus, when he fills us with the Spirit, suddenly we have a love for the world. For the lost. People without Christ. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 and 14, for the love of Christ compels us because we're convinced that one, Jesus died for all. We're all convinced that Jesus died on the cross, rose again and brought eternal life and our love for people compels us to go preach the gospel. The love of God compels us, Paul says. It drives us. It motivates us. It gives us a love for the lost so that we can't forget them. We can't cease to pray for them. We can't cease to go and preach to them because we love them with a love that comes from God. We love the world the way God so loved the world that he gave. Is only big. That love is now within us, within our frail, limited human capacity, and yet it is there. And when you know it, you feel it, you sense it. That is the power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit to fill us with the love of God for the lost. One day Jesus got out of the boat and landed on the shoreline, and the Bible says in Matthew 14 and 14, when Jesus saw the crowds, he was moved with compassion, and he healed their sick. And when he finished teaching the Sermon on the Mount, as soon as he came down the mountainside, a leper came running up to Jesus, fell on his knees, and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And the Bible says in Mark 1 and 41, filled with compassion, Jesus touched the leper and said, I'm willing, be clean. Jesus, filled with compassion. And when a rich young ruler who had everything, he was rich, he was young, and he was in charge. What else do you need, right? And the Bible says he came to Jesus. He got on his knees in honor and said, good teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said, you know the commandments of God. And he said, I've kept all these since I was a youth. And Luke 10 and 21 says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. When we look at people, how do we feel? Jesus looked at him. He saw him in his true spiritual state. He didn't see him as rich. 
young or powerful, he saw his heart. He saw his spiritual need. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Said, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And come follow me. Jesus looked at him and loved him. And how can we get our minds around that amazing scene of our Savior nailed to the crucifix? Who can imagine the excruciating pain in his body for six years? And yet, the soldiers gambling for his clothing, the religious people that came by mocked him and cursed him and called him a blasphemer and said that God was judging him. And yet from the cross, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That love God has poured out into our hearts. And that's why we need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And we need to continually go back to Pentecost and say, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit that that love, that divine love might rule and reign in our hearts. You know, when you get sick with an infection, you go to the doctor, the doctor gives you an antibiotic and it cures the infection. And that's the power of the love the Holy Spirit gives. The love of God is the antibiotic to anger and rage and resentment and bitterness and unforgiveness and selfishness and self-centeredness and greed and idolatry. It purges the soul. God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given to us. He pours out his love finally through us. He Stanley Jones said, the Holy Spirit is like electricity. He never goes in where it can't come out. And the whole purpose of being filled with the Spirit is to live an overflowing life. And that's every time the word filled is used in the Bible, it means you fill it to the place that it spills over. And I'm sure you've done that. You've been filling up something or talking on your cell phone. You realize half of it's on the counter. You ever done that? Fill doesn't mean just fill it up. Most of the way it means fill it up too much. David said, my cup runs over. Anybody have an overflowing life here today? Jesus said, I've come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. It means to fill it to the brim and it's overflowing. Paul said, I'm praying for you that you'll overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit in Romans 15 and 13. You see, God pours out his love into us that it may spill over from us. So I want to close today with Jesus' invitation to us. John chapter 7, verse 37 through 39. The Bible says on the last and greatest day of the festival that was tabernacles, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water shall flow from within him. John adds, by this he meant the Spirit whom those who believed in him would later receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. And Jesus stands here in the midst of this great assembly today and all of you at home online. And he speaks to us and he says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, rivers of living water shall flow from within him. The last day, the greatest day of the Festival of Tabernacles. It was eight days. The first seven days, every day, the priest would go to the pool of Siloam in Jerusalem with a jar of water and fill it up and he'd bring it and pour water and wine on the altar of God in the temple. Seven days. But on the eighth day, he would not bring any water. It was the day of completion. It was the day of fulfillment. And Jesus stood on the eighth day, the greatest day. And he said, everything in the Old Testament is being fulfilled today. Today, if anyone is thirsty, not for religion, not for science, not for philosophy, not for politics, if anyone's spiritually thirsty and the things of this world can't satisfy your spiritual quest for God and for meaning in life, let him come to me and drink. For out of his inmost being, some translations say, out of his heart, and you know what translation gets it? technically correct, is the King James Version. They actually translate it verbatim, where it reads, out of his belly. That's the Greek word kolias. It's not the Greek word cardia. It's not your heart. That's another great image of our soul. This is different. Out of your belly, your kolias. 
will flow rivers of living water. Gut level pain, deep emotion. You know, the ancients associated emotion with the stomach. Colias can refer to your stomach. It can refer to a mother's womb, to your gut level expression, your deepest level of compassion out of your belly, out of your very soul, out of the essence of your being is what it means. Rivers, not one river, rivers of mercy, rivers of compassion, rivers of forgiveness, rivers of generosity shall flow from within you. It's not something you're trying to do because you're being religiously obligated. It's something you can't help to do because you're so full of the love of God that you cannot help but love. And if you're trying to make yourself forgive, forget all of that. Go into the prayer closet and say, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit, baptize me with love, and you won't be able to do anything but forgive. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts, Zechariah 4 and 6. Out of your belly. It's interesting that the gastrointestinal system of the body has its own nervous system. The involuntary system of your body has three subsystems, and one is in the gastrointestinal area. The endemic system, and it is so developed that it can function independently with its nervous system of the central nervous system. It's the only organ of the body that can function independently of the central nervous system, which is your brain and your spinal cord. It's so advanced. It can function on its own. And the love of God in you, this is a metaphor Jesus is using. It's so powerful, so great. It can override every other resistance. It can be so captivating that it flows from within us like rivers of living water. And Jesus said, if you're thirsty for something spiritual, if you're thirsty for fullness, come to me and drink. And that's what we need to do today. We need to spend this moment before the Lord saying, Lord, fill me today. Baptize me in the Holy Spirit. Lord, I receive the love poured out, poured into my heart. Lord, fill me to such a place that rivers of living water flow from within me. Would you join me in prayer? Father, today we come before you. We wait in prayer the way those early disciples did on the day of Pentecost. If you're sharing this moment of prayer and you believe in your heart and you're thirsty spiritually, would you take a moment and just turn your palms toward heaven and lift your hands and say, Lord Jesus, fill me with the Holy Spirit right here, right now. I receive you in your baptism. I receive you in your fullness. I receive you in your gifts. I receive you in your fruit. Come, Holy Spirit, fill me to an overflowing measure that Christ may be seen in me. In Jesus' holy name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Would you just stand with Thank me this morning for, for a moment? I want to salute you. We've had an amazing time worshiping the Lord together. Today is Pentecost Sunday. We celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. It's also Memorial Day weekend, and we honor those who have given their lives in the defense of the freedom of this great nation. I would encourage you to join me this summer for my new Bible study, The Gifts of the Holy Spirit. It goes on demand every week. Subscribe to my podcast. You can watch. You can also listen while you drive, listen while you work out. And we trust that you'll be a part of this great study for the summer. Thank you for your generous support of the Mount Perry Ministries, for your faithful prayer and partnership. What we do, we do together. We love you. We're praying for you and your family. Have an amazing week. I'll see you next Sunday for worship.